military theme rings, and I've acquired several dozen. So what do I do with them? So after seven years, I said research, editing, writing, I produced the book. I realized that the collecting military themes rings is a narrow field. However, every ring tells a story. As the fields were plowed and the trenches were filled in after World War I, the work of clearance and reconstruction preserved the battlefield under a thin layer of earth. Collectors, whatever you collect, preserves history too, whether it's a helmet, a bayonet, a medal, a military theme ring, they each hold the story. I feel an echo up here. Is, it, is there an echo in the audience? Yes. I don't know if there, you can do anything about that. I don't know. All right. We're not advancing. Pushing the arrow on the right, is that it? So military rings are a unique facet of a memorabilia. Each of the other rings displayed in my book is connected to a geographical area, a campaign, an ideology, a unit, a memorable event, or an achievement. The German and Spanish military rings is the only book in print that provides a historical contents for military theme rings. It's also the only book that examines both German and Spanish military rings and their links to nationalism, patriotism, populism, and a spirit and core. All the rings in the book are private purchased by soldiers <clears throat> as the mementos of the 1930s and 40s, except for the Himmler Totenkopf ring. And we'll talk about that later. So let's take a look at a couple of these rings. Well, we're going backwards now. So here's a, um, <clears throat> what is it up here? Four yards, I'm going to look at the, all right, here's the machine gunner, okay. All right, so this is a lovely uh, 800 silver. It's a similar to the World War German uh, machine gunner's patch you see up on the upper right. So machine guns had a high rate of fire, became an integral part of both the offense and the defense. And as the war dragged on, more power power was added, doubling the number of German machine guns per company from six to 12 per company. And by war's end, the Germans had 2,500 machine gun companies. <clears throat> this is uh, called the Iron for Gold program. Unlike France and Britain, Germany was excluded from international finance markets at the outbreak of World War I. Germany's natural reserves dwindled as the war dragged on, and the Kaiser urged patriotic citizens to exchange gold for iron, such as their jewelry and other valuables, for simple metal objects. This program actually goes back to the Franco-Prussian War of 1870, because they were 
It's expensive to run a war. So these uh, rings at the bottom, they have these different engravings, homeland because these different times they gave gold for this iron and my loyalty to the fatherland. The one on the bottom left, they were actually promoted here in the United States. And I'm sure it went underground when we got into the war. I had a friend of mine, he showed me he had three that his mother bought for her three sons, and she still had them. Uh, in the bottom right, here's someone that wanted to show their patriotic duty. They had theirs lined with gold. So there's a 10, 15% of the population is a hypersensitivity to metal. It's a disorder of an immune system that can cause skin reaction. And some ladies, uh, women that buy jewelry, they can only wear gold jewelry because of that reaction. So she, she had hers lined with gold. The top center one is actually a part of a watch fob assembly. And that was actually made in, by a firm in New Jersey. So, so it's an old program, Iron for Gold. And uh, they're not difficult to find in the market. So if you're looking for a collecting area, it's not very expensive. There's quite a few of those out there. So here's a, a cute iron cross in a box. So was this a gift? Was it a souvenir? Was it an indication that this gentleman earned the iron cross? I don't know. A lot of those things are just lost to history, but is it a nice little ring from World War I era? This is a silver wash ring with a brass facing top with a World War I uh, coal shuttle helmet. It's between the dates 39 and 40, and that's a conundrum. Did he serve one year in the Polish campaign? Did he serve in World War I and World War II? So it's an interesting work of art, but it's a conundrum to the collector. <clears throat> this is a symbol of the uh, Spanish Falange. It was a fascist party that supported Franco during the Civil War. Uh, the arrow was pointed up until Franco came into power, then the tradition is to wear him down. Now, <clears throat> this is, um, this is uh, the idea, it's a bundle of arrows is stronger than a single arrow, and the cross piece is known as a Gordian knot, and it's got some other religious connotations. It's similar to um, our, uh, our, silver our silver dime some years ago. We have a facies on there, it's got a bundle of rods is stronger than a single rod. Um, when King Ferdinand married Queen Isabella and they joined their kingdoms, that became the country of Spain, and this was part of their unit crest. And then it was adopted by, by the fascists that supported Franco during Spain's Civil War. This is uh, Mount Thousand. It's a, it was a concentration camp. It is also known as the Spanish uh, Inquisition uh, or the Spanish um, Holocaust. As uh, Franco won the war, a lot of the supporters on, the, re on the, the Republican side, the nationalists won the war, and they were looked very favorably, and uh, Franco would round them up and execute them, so they, a lot of them escaped to France. And then France gets into World War II, and a lot of them are picked up by the Nazis, and they're sent off to this camp. So about seven to 10,000 of the Spanish Republicans and Republican sympathizers were sent to this camp, and they were pretty well worked to death. So if it ran out of in fact, history, that's the name of the book, and that's the name of the author. This is, no, this is a very substantial ring. It's more of a souvenir to a ring because it is vast. Many Republic, uh, Franco despised the Bolsheviks for supporting the Republicans, and he was, uh, which was the duly elected government that he took over. So he rounded up 16,000 volunteers to go fight on the Russian front because he just couldn't stand the Bolsheviks. <coughs> Also, there was many political opponents that didn't quite volunteer to went to Russia. And they were all dressed in German uniforms. They were known as the 250th Division. 
and they were compromised as three infantry regiments comparable to a, a German infantry unit. Uh, the monument was no possible relief until extinction. And historians rate them as excellent soldiers. They actually saw themselves as warriors. And uh, they got a lot of heavy casualty, got really beat up in the war, and they did especially good in the defense. And I found um, a Russian officer's diary, and he made a note in his diary, do not attack a defensive Spanish position without proper artillery preparation. They just did not give up land. So uh, what I'm telling you, every ring, every ring tells a story. So in November of eight, 1942, the Allies lost, launched Operation Torch, which combined landings of British American forces in Northwest Africa, Casablanca, Algiers, and Oran. Oran became one of the major supply points of the Allies. In May of 43, about 150 African Corps soldiers and Germans army were shipped out of there to POW camps. So this could have been, uh, it has a silver wash in this brass. So forget that the French were there, the Germans were there, the Americans there. So we have these little artisans, Algerians cranking these out to make a couple extra bucks. And so soldiers buy them, pick them up, take them home as souvenirs. <clears throat> now this ring I found fascinating. This opened up a segment of World War II I was not aware of. It's totally new discovery. So we don't know who the, uh, the owner was. It's either FC or CF, but we see it has a rack in 1941 on the side. By the end of 1943, there's 30,000 American troops in Iraq during World War II. What are they doing there? It's part of the Lend-Lease program is supporting getting materials to the Russians. You can ship it up through the North Sea and deal with the frozen ports, and then deal with, especially with the submarines, or come in the Mediterranean up through the Persian Gulf. And this actually became known as the Persian Gulf Command. And there's a book out, and that's the title of Persian Gulf Command. So, <clears throat> so they operated 36 different camps, 44 different airstrips across the desert of Iraq. And they had to build an infrastructure, barracks, mess halls, hospitals, water treatment plants, uh, clothing facilities to support all these troops. All right? <clears throat> So the Persian Gulf Command delivered 4,158,117 tons of cargo to the Russians through this route. So when it got up to the Persian Gulf, then it had to be roads built, railroads, tunnels, tracks laid, trains had to be brought in. So it was quite an operation. The boxes you see at the bottom right are airplanes. Totally disassembled, put in crates and shipped by over there. Then they have to be put together. You got to have trained people, mechanics to put those together, tested. The Russian pilots would come down, get the planes, fly them up and use them in the war against Germany. So it was quite an operation called the Persian Gulf Command. Um, okay, there's some Russian pilots up top there. Now, uh, plus the thousands of jeeps, trucks, artillery pieces, and anything else the Russians could use to take the pressure off the, uh, the Western Front. How many knew the Army had railroad battalions? The Military Railroad Service was created in the 1920s as a reserve force the quartermaster of the division of the United States Army. It existed twice before as a U.S. Railroad, military railroad during the Civil War, and then later by the U.S. Railroad Administration during World War I. Now, it takes some skilled people to run railroads. The Army doesn't have a lot of trained people to do that. 
So they came, people came to the United States and recruited union workers throughout, Pens throughout the United States to go there and to run these railroads. And to put an extra incentive on them to go there, they hired French chefs for the mess halls. <laughs> so it worked, it worked. Missed my notes there. All right, the Hitler Youth. Right, they used a single rune to indicate the Hitler Youth. Hitler came to power in 1933, and Hitler Youth became the only official youth organization. Hitler Youth became the foundation of Nazi propaganda machine. It's a way for the Nazis to ensure continuance of their ideology by introducing the nation's young. Children who support and a quote, inappropriate behaviors or attitudes within their family. Hitler made it clear when he said, the weak must be chiseled away. I want young men and women who can suffer pain. A young German must be swift as a greyhound, as tough as leather, and as hard as Krupp steel. If anybody's looking for a topic, the Zeppelin, you could call it the first Air Force. Air balloons as far back as the Franco-Prussian War were active. During the Franco-Prussian War, Paris was surrounded, and to get some of the wounded out, they airlifted them about balloon to get medical treatment and that was in 1870. The Zeppelins bombed England during World War I. <clears throat> so could this be declared the first Air Force? Through 1935 and 1937 was the golden age of the airship passenger service. <clears throat> the airships flew 30, 34 of Atlantic crossings plus numerous promotional tours. And all the dream of future service came crashing down in flames when the Hindenburg burnt at Lakehurst, New Jersey in May 1937. And that ended the golden age of airships. Uh, this is the uh, emblem that's on the pilot's cap that flew these. And uh, the, 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 you can't call them stewardesses anymore, the flight attendants. The man, these ships, uh, they had that on their uniform. And every now and then you'll see one of those that comes up on a plate, a souvenir, or a mug someplace. And uh, there's a guy at, it, at the Allentown uh, military show, and he's got a collection of those plates up there. So another ring that tells the story. There's a number of ladies' patriotic rings, and there's just, just a few of them. So most of these are 925 silver. So we gave away for the women to share their pride serving the Fuhrer by donating these rings. They're made out of plastics, polyurethane, cellophane, and bakelite. And in the 30s, that was new. That was high technology of the day. It took an exceptional jeweler to make a ring on the bottom left with a swatch enclosed in that plastic and mounted on a silver band. There was a number of women's organizations. There's a few there. The BDM was the League for German Girls, or the Band of German Mothers. The, it was the Girls' Wings of the Nazi Party. A youth, 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 youth joined these different organizations. It was the only legal female youth organization in Nazi Germany at the time. Uh, the BDM came in three sections. And girls from 10 to 14, 14 to 18, and then he went what's called the Faith and Beauty Society girls, which is 17 to 21. So a lot of it was due to compulsory membership of all young women, except for those excluded for racial reasons. <clears throat> so at the end of the war, it had four and a half, about four and a half million members. This living space, as the Germans moved east, 
they occupied these lands in Poland, Czechoslovakia, and Romania, and all these places. They had plans to occupy that, and so they need people. So they encourage women to have more children, so when the time came, they can occupy these lands. And so they had a lot of, a lot of future plans for that. And of course, they couldn't join, the women couldn't belong to any business, political issues, they couldn't be professional teachers or lawyers and things like that. This was a school run by this lady here, uh, Gertrude Schrock Klink. And if you wanted to marry an SS officer, you had to go to this school. Uh, but it disallowed females with Jewish or gypsy blood, mental illness, or physical deformities. The Wright Blythe School were instituted and established in Germany in the late 1930s. They were created to train young women to be the perfect Nazi bride. Introduced in Nazi ideology and educated in house, housekeeping skills. They were going to be fiancés of prominent SS members. Uh, some of those could be Nazi party officials. And a, and a large range of women attended these schools because you wanted to be part of the elite. Future brides were taught social skills, skills in cooking, child care, ironing, and how to polish your husband's uniform and his daggers. So, graduates were issued a certificate and failures were denied and they could not marry an SS soldier. So you can imagine all this control of the whole society in Germany. So, this is an interesting ring. This is uh, the National Air Road Protection League. It was instituted in 1933 responsible for training German men and women in civil defense against air raids. In 1939, this organization had 75,000 local units, comprised about 12 million members, which rose to about 22 million by 1945. You can remember all the bombing that's gone in by that time in late 44, 45 in Russia, or Germany, and somebody has to respond to the injured, the fires, put the fires out, and so forth. So the league tapped into a lot of unemployment women. Millions were mobilized. Now, <clears throat> this emblem changed three times during the war. This is the last change. This is the 1944 model. So somebody that would buy this in late 1944 must have had big hopes that Russia was still, or Germany was still going to win the war. And so, <clears throat> a short stop victory wing. One was made for each branch of service. They had one for the Air Force, the Luftwaffe, for, for the Navy, and the Army. And um, this is 835 silver. So Victory must have been confident that some juror is contract to make these rings. I've, uh, <clears throat> like I said, there was different design for each branch of the service. The sides are delicate with feathered large oak leaves scrolled in black enamel. And uh, I got this and the, the, the story that came with this, that it, the German jeweler that worked on these, as the Russians were coming into Berlin, grabbed the box of these and took them home and had them hidden for 50 some years. And after his passing, the family got him out and sold them. So a friend of mine was traveling in Germany at this flea market, picked this up for me, and, uh, and he sent it home to me, and here it is. Uh, it's a gorgeous ring, it's a very substantial ring, and um, you wonder who would have been issued to, the Knights Cross winners or certain high-level political people. I don't know. We just don't know who it would have been gone to. So. All right. Most people are familiar with the token call frame, the upper left, uh, issued um, the only ring presented by the Third Right. 
all the warnings you received were private purchase from jewelers. Because you can go to the United States, any military base, and go to the PX, and you can find military rings represent somebody went to air, air, uh, air assault school, they're a paratrooper, they're in a tank unit, they went to the Sergeant Majors Academy. I went to the Sergeant Majors Academy down at Fort Bliss. I didn't buy a ring, I don't need another ring. So to just represent something you did in the service that you're proud of. So this was created by the orders of Reich Fuhrer SF Heinrich Himmler. It was not a state official war, but bestowed personally by Himmler on his selected few, mostly the SS guys. It was originally presented to the senior officers of the old guard. And still a count of about 11,500 of these rings have just appeared from history. So there's some ways, some ways sock drawer, a jewelry case, who knows where they are. But some of them do know where they are. The US Army Captain Theodore Black was one of the first Americans who entered Wiesburg, Wiesbels, by the way, you can't get that pronounced in a German, <laughs> Wiesburg Castle. This castle was a three-cornered castle built in the 1700s, used by Himmler as his S Reich SS leadership school. Captain Black states, and I quote, I found a box of about 200 silver SS rings, which are awarded to the SS men and bore the name, date, and copy of H. Himmler's inscription on the side of the ring. The rings were distributed among my men and my company as war souvenirs to take home. Many of these rings have never surfaced before. If you can find, you'll find them on the market now and then, but you have to be very careful. There's a couple books just on the ring, how to identify them. But if you don't have the provenance to go with it, it's not worth much. And if you're in the market for one, prepare to make out a second mortgage. So. The ring on the bottom right, and, and, I will, and I will say, some of these questionable, and we don't really have a way to know, we don't know who manufactured these, we don't know if they're post-war, the war period and post-war, they could be, but they each tell a story about the war regardless. <clears throat> like many, like I say, many Pierre rings, the designer and manufacturer is unknown. I believe this represents the third SS Panzer Division, which was really established in 1939 as the SS Division Tokenkopf. The unit's emblem was the Tokenkopf death head skull with crossbones. It was originally commanded by SS Obergruppführer Theodor Eek, that's E-I-C-K, who was the original architect of the Nazi concentration camps. The ring has a prominent SS runes embedded in Bakelite, which was a new invention in the 30s, a high distinctive skull and crossbones on each side. Uh, if you have an uh, interest in knowing more about the token cough rings, there's a book out by Greg Atlib. It's put out by Schaefer uh, Military History. The token cough ring, an illustrated history from Munich to Nuremberg. As it's easy to get on, the, uh, on Google. <clears throat> so why do did, why did soldiers purchase these things? Well, you mentioned in the introduction, it's something to commemorate what you did in the service. How, how many people have a ring here in the audience that remember something to do with your service? Anybody? Yeah, okay, there are a few hands wiggling down there and everybody's shouting, yeah. So? Now this is what we watch in the news these days. This is a Q, a rectangular face with a leaf design and bordered with stars in the four corners. Now, I don't know if it's two initials or three initials in the middle, but we're never going to know who originally uh, uh, bought this ring. But it's a, it's a very handsome ring. The sides are attractively decorated and the face beveled and embossed. Uh, it's personally stylized with the MK on the phrase. The Battle of Q, K-I-E-W, took place outside of Kiev, 
And you hear Kiev in the news in the Ukraine all the time now, which is the capital of Ukraine, and the great patriotic war museum commemorating Ukraine's liberation during World War II opened in October 1974. And I hope they planned for an addition when they kicked the Russians out. <laughs> Two lovely Luftwaffe rings. Two exceptionally quality Luftwaffe rings in the book. One's black onyx, and the other one's a rare Dominican blue amber. I had a jeweler friend take a look at all these rings, and he gave me the idea what the silver content was and what the stones were, so I can validate those. All right. Most lately, commissioned by a jeweler who made these up. I can't imagine them making a lot of them because you don't know who's going to buy them. So we're probably probably commissioned by somebody if it was probably their service. The DAK, Dutch Alphacal Corps, securing North Africa was vital for the Allies, the defense of Egypt and the Suez Canal. And that forced the Germans to bring mother's supplies across the desert over 930 miles of desert to the, from the port of Tripoli. When you're running heavy equipment at that distance, it really wears out in the desert. So it was a really disadvantage for the Germans. The handsome masculine silver ring by a local Arab, a Tijan, probably made these. You have the British there, you have the Americans there, uh, the French were there. So some little artisan is cranking these out and making a few extra bucks. So <clears throat> it's an unusual souvenir, like I said, probably German, English, American during the invasion of North Africa. So from a simple ring, you can tell the whole history of the African campaign if you choose to. So every ring tells a story. This was an unusual find. This contemporary set and cufflink set is very similar to the actually paratrooper badge. In 1937, the Army used its own parachute badge. However, this was discontinued after the Luftwaffe took over all parachute operations. The Germans were the first paratroopers to participate in large scale airborne ops in World War II, most likely worn by a paratrooper during their unit's reunions. And they had reunions too after the war. Probably not as exciting as ours because they were on the losing end. But, so. but it is a very handsome set. Here's some souvenirs from the Western Front. The, belt, the Nazis built two defensive structures, the Atlantic Wall and the West Wall, to repulse the Allied attacks. The Atlantic Wall stretched 1,670 miles from Norway down to the Spanish border. Imagine all that construction, all the manpower, all the engineering, all the supplies that had to be delivered for that. A tremendous operation. And this was decorated by architect, uh, designed by architect Wright Minister Fritz Tolt, who also designed the Autobahns and many other structures in Germany. The West Wall, also known as the Sinkfield Line, was built in the 1930s, and it stretched 390 miles from the German border with the Netherlands to the Swiss border. The West Wall Metal on the bottom right was instituted in August the 2nd, 1939, and it was presented to the designers of the wall, the builders, and throughout Germany, they had hundreds of monuments, statues, markers across the country, and they, wrote, they, they referred to historic events. This interesting ring, uh, the name on this ring translates to sound like a technical advisor. And it seems to be this guy was an Air Force instructor. So the side of it has a diving, uh, a diving, uh, a Schmidt Messerschmitt airplane, and it's got the date 1942 on there. 
It's got two, a uh, couple interlocking leaves surrounding the, the band. And uh, I got this from a, a, a World War II veteran's widow. Okay, the other one on the right, the gold, uh, the Germans use these gold colors to indicate a particular field. So this is uh, aviation. And different colors would be for the different branches of the service. So this is equal to about a tech sergeant, the rank. There's three gulls on there. This is a stunning, handsome ring. High German quality, with the raised SS uh, rings on there. Eye-catching, prominent brass ring, 835 silver. The sides are adorned with elongated, raised, and detailed oak leaves, which are Nordic, Celtic, symbols of life, nobility, fertility, and immortality. Most likely purchased by somebody who was very proud of the position and an important person. So, yeah, it's, a, it's, a, it's one of my favorite rings. So. And I have a couple of people who are anxious to get that. So. A couple of examples from World War I. We got the uh, coup de guerre here on the bottom, the French uh, award. Uh, that nice one in the top left on a brass iron cross on that silver wash ring. If you're, uh, I have a, a watch fob up there to say, I had a watch fob collection. There's actually international watch fob agency and collectors. It's, it's a way to be in the collecting business without spending a lot of money and something that's not going to be reproduced or being faked. There's a whole array of, of um, watch fob out there. It's endless, the collections you can do. And you can put the story together and every watch fob to tell the story itself. I'll give you a minute to study that. What's the difference here in these two rings? They represent the wound badges. I'm gonna guess these are post-war, but you can tell the whole story about wound badges. You can put a book, there's, if you can, there's a book out of wound badges worldwide, I have a book on that, and every country has some type of a wound badge. And of course, we call it a Purple Heart. Because once you take the uniform off, unless you have a hat that says with a Purple Heart on that, it's another way to show that you served in combat were wounded. And they came in, of course, you know, black, silver, and gold, depending on the number of wounds or the severity of the wounds. Notice the different style helmets. The one on the left, after World War I, they had quite a supply of wound badges left over. And so they took those badges back and re-stamped the swastika on it to give to the men of the Legion Condor who served in Spain. They were black, silver, and gold. They never gave a gold one out. You can buy gold ones and you're in a collecting market but they never issued a gold one. So the one on the right is a World War II style helmet. And they have different, uh, they have different leaves going around the edges. So you have to have a very dis uh, discriminating eye to spot the difference. Uh, so, the one, so the one on the left is the, uh, which is called the Legion Condor wound badge. On the one on the right is the World War II badge. This, this, is a, this is a symbol of the uh, 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 Spanish Civil War, the phalange. And so we have these brass uh, oak, and arrow, oak and arrows on this uh, Bakelite. If you're in the service in the 50s or 60s, you're, you're probably your mess tray was made out of Bakelite. And the coffee cups and pistol grips and bayonet grips were made out of Bakelite. So. And on the right is the symbol of the Yazoo Division, the Blue Division. And I think I said earlier, uh, Franco stayed out of World War II because he was devastated. And he got the volunteers, which was a technical way to get him involved to fight the Russians because he couldn't declare war because then he had the, uh, the, uh, the allies against him, France, Germany, and England, we all be against Franco. And eventually he was warned you're on, you're on shaky ground. And
And so some part late in the, in the 1944s, he withdrew his, his um, Spanish troops. Some stayed on their own. And so some souvenirs to the printer. So the one on the bottom right is a, just a lapel pin. Uh, <clears throat> dating skulls. If you're, uh, if you're collecting uh, items and uh, the skulls are very difficult to, to, uh, to age, and there's a, if you can find on the internet, some item, there just have been dozens and dozens and dozens of them, they're probably all reproductions. And so it takes a lot of handling of old material to determine is it World War I, pre-World War I, is it World War II, and so forth. So there's different styles. So at one point, there was no bottom jaw, and then later there was a bottom jaw. So it's described in my book, so if you're interested, so. So, as I said throughout, every wing tells a story. So there are not medals issued by a grateful nation, but rather intimate witness to capture moments and events of their own past. So we choose rings, and if you travel and you have a ring, you bought it for a particular purpose, and so people in the military buy rings uh, that represent the something they did in the service. All right. Anyone have any questions? Okay. okay, thank you, thank you, thank you. We'll do q and A in a, in a minute here. Uh, one more round of applause for Mr. Shaw. I just want to say, you know, as a history teacher, the history t is about the truth. It's about evidence. It's about stories. It's about experiences. And Mr. Shaw has uh, shared with us a unique window into World War One, World War Two and the Spanish Civil War history. Each ring does tell a story, and there's much more to discover and explore. I think we were all um, you know, impressed with the details and the backstory that exists, and hopefully you go out and you pursue a little bit more uh, about each or, each or several of these topics. His book is for sale out there. Uh, at this time, I'll turn it over to Dr. Chris Huffman, who's the president of our organization. He has a, a gift and a handshake for Mr. Steve Shaw. Thank you, Seth. Thank you very much. Steve, um, you're pretty familiar with these, I think, by now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thank, thank you very much, Steve. Yeah, sure. So, um, Steve, uh, he's been a loyal member and coming to our meetings for so many years. And um, uh, we're going to have question and answer period before the uh, closing remarks. But, um, but uh, I just want to thank Steve for a wonderful presentation. Uh, I know we have a lot of people here not just passionate about World War II, but also probably some of you collect military and military items as well, and so this kind of gives you a, a foray into that kind of field as well. Um, but yeah, uh, so Steve's been coming to our meetings for many years, and we're so glad he could finally speak for us now. Thank you, Steve, again. You're welcome. And, and, and we'll, um, I'll, I'll have some more closing remarks later, but right now we're going to turn the question and answer period, and my colleague uh, Seth is going to help me with the microphone, and he'll kind of be on one side, I'll be on the other side, so uh, please raise your hands, and we'll ha be happy to bring the mics to you. Thank you. What's the value of the most expensive ring you have? <laughs> I, I, the easy answer is eight hundred dollars. Okay, that's the victory ring. Yeah, yeah, the victory ring. Uh, that was an expensive ring to buy, uh, so I have a small markup on that, and I've been, um, uh, I've been. Uh, um, Really, uh, it's, they're tough to sell. Like anybody who has a really substantial, nice collection, it's really hard to part with those things. In the back of my book, mentioning that, I have a chapter how to dispose, dispose of your collection. Uh, I have it in PowerPoint, uh, just that chapter. I gave it to a coin collecting, a numerous club, to a post office club, a stamp club. Organizing your collection and listing everything is time consuming, is very emotional, because you spend a lifetime collecting that, you gotta put a value on it, and, uh, and then you gotta, you, you, have to, you have to subject to, the, you have to make up in mind you're gonna sell it. Don't put it in your will, all right? Don't put it in your will, be, 
because when it goes in your will, then whoever's the executive has to pay something to evaluate that and they'll pay taxes on it. So, so make a list and give it to the attorney, say these things get to go to these relatives or whoever you want it to go to, but don't put it in the will. So yeah, I have a whole chapter in that, had to dis dispose of your collection. Yeah. There, I think there was another question, the lady over here again. I just wondered how you got interested in uh, You know, I, I get that question a lot. Uh, like I said earlier in the program, my, my focus when Spain's Civil War did its cost by attention, and it's nice to know uh, a little bit about something. And they, they, these things would just show up at different military shows, and I'd get one here, and I'd get one there, and I'd ask, what are we doing them all? <laughs> so I said, well, I want to put them in a story, tell the story. So it'd be seven years of research, a lot of correspondence, and, uh, and, and look up the backstory of a different, like, North Africa. I mean, you can follow on information and pick out some more uh, things. In my book, I have what's called um, uh, author, author's notes, so I have a little sidebar information that you probably don't read in many other books. And, and it just became self-therapy in a way. Yeah. So my other half, she went through a couple dozen red pens doing all the uh, spelling corrections and things like that. But, you know, I really enjoyed it. I find, uh, lucky I found a local publisher who we become friends. I just had dinner with him last night. He's usually here on Thursday nights, but he couldn't make it. And, uh, and you have to know how a book, the, the language of the book producing industry, how to lay it out. So, so you see, see two names in the book, my name and another guy's name, Mike Ravel. Why? The most expensive thing to do in the book, as a lot of pictures, is the Photoshop layout of the book. So just like when they put these slides together, it takes hours to put these slides together. Yeah. So you need somebody who has that technical expertise. Yeah. Have you met anybody who had um, well, at the Allentown show, which I go to often, and you wander around, uh, I saw one of those rings in my book the guy had in his display case. I said, tell me about that ring. And he tells me everything, you know. I said, you know, if you had one of these books, you could double the price of that ring. <laughs> yeah. Yes, he did. Question, question yeah. for you, sir. A fabulous collection. Thank you. My understanding is at some period of time in Germany, if you were caught selling Nazi memorabilia in flea markets, et cetera, number one, you could be arrested, and number two, it would be taken away from you. Yes, yes, and I think it's still true. But most of these, except for one or two, my Greek friend, uh, who, he travels the circuit, and he sees these, and he, he'd buy a couple of them, and he'd send them to me, he'd say, pick out the ones you want, send me the money, send the other ones back. You know, who does business like that anymore? But I was glad that he did. And, uh, but most of them I've got to, there's some really quality auction houses online that have a good reputation. And if you're buying stuff like that, always get the return policy. Uh, any dealer you get, get the return policy. And most of them I have bought because I personally found them at some military show. Yeah, yeah. I used to go to the Orders and Metal Societies conventions. This year it's down in Florida. And, um, well, even better, over uh, the two biggest shows in the United States is the Show of Shows, which is down in Kentucky, and the other one used to be outside of Pittsburgh, the Max Show. Now they moved it to York. Last year was the first year in York, you know, a short drive. You'll see 300 dealers there, and a lot of Europeans. And uh, I used to, uh, one of the side collections, um, I, I've written and published about 15 magazine articles, and something just tells you to dive into the subject. So I did an article in uh, Finland, and Finland had some special medals they made out. Finland had three mini wars during World War II. And he had these different medals. So I got all the medals, wrote an article, now what are we doing them? Well, they have a lot of Russians attend this show. They fly over here and attend this show because it's an international market. And they bought everything I had. And every time I see another Russian, I raise the price. Another Russian raised the price again. <laughs> so they bought all the, all the, all the Finland stuff. 
But that's, that's business. What are you going to do? Yeah, yeah. So I, I already have a table reserved over there. So it's a, it's a, it's, it's a huge auditorium. There's at least 300 and a lot of internationally. If you're buying or selling, you, this is the place to be because everything's negotiable. Yes, sir. I can pass my cup. So. Yes, sir. Oh, I like your hat. I like your hat. Oh, yeah. Yes. How, how horrible is it to find those rings? How you, you have to you have to do a lot of looking. Do you ever go out with Dad to buy shoes? Uh, some real or like two stuff. Yeah. So you look at it, you, you have to look at a lot to, so you can make a decision what you're going to buy. Okay. Yeah. I was just going to now with shoes. So how many pairs of shoes you look at the shoe store? Could you finally pick one out? Yeah. yeah. Bunch. Yeah, a bunch of them. Yeah. He narrowed it down to two. Left and right foot. <laughs> you, you, you remind me of an audience. Not long ago, a friend invited me to go to this um, Sunday school. And I went with him, and I uh, walking down the aisle, and I saw this young lady, this young girl sitting there, and she had this picture. I said, tell me, what's your, what's your picture? And she said, it's a whale. I said, well, what's sticking out of his mouth? She said, that's Jonah. I said, oh, okay. She must have heard that in the story. I said, but you know, you know, as a, as, a, as a life science teacher, I said, you know, a whale can't swallow anything that big. She said, yes, he will. <clears throat> she said, yes, he can. I said, well, how are you going to find out? She says, when I get to heaven, I'll ask you. <laughs> I said, well, what if, what if Jonah goes down below? And she looked at me very soon, then you ask him. <laughs> Another question? Oh, back here. I've known Stephen for a long time, and we do <laughs> some shows together. And I just want to put a plug in for the Map Show. I judged the Map Show for about 10 years and <clears throat> got to hold uh, Rommel's Field Marshal Baton and Mussolini's Fez. And there may be 300 dealers, but there's usually 12 to 1,400 tables. And it really is worth, it's like walking through a museum. So if you get a chance, it's only in September. Not sure what day it is this year, but uh, it's like eight bucks to get in, and it, you will enjoy the show, I guarantee. Thanks, Jeff. Um, these were all from Europe and stuff. Are there many in the United States from the Civil War or the Revolutionary War? Did they have rings? Um, she said in the Civil War, Revolutionary War, did they have rings too? And uh, how about maybe give me a little bit about those as well? I'm, I'm not familiar with this during the Civil War. I'm sure, uh, you know, people make rings to sell them, you know, and these, these people are always on the move, always on the move. And you have to think of the economy at that time. Did they have the money to buy something like that? They had trouble just feeding the troops at the time. So I really don't know a true answer, but it's, it's, it's an interesting question. Yeah, but definitely World War I, they did uh, have a lot of rings. Yeah. If, if I could add to that, that theme of questions, did you, do you have any, any rings in your collection from the Asia Pacific Theater? No. No, I don't. There is a gentleman at the Allentown, which is known as the Forks of the Delaware uh, uh, organization there. He has a stand there. He's right across from one of the food stands. He's got a fabulous collection of American rings, of all branches of the service, different periods from back in the 20s, the 30s, the 40s, up to the 60s. And they're all American rings, some from the different uh, academies, Annapolis and West Point, things like that. You know. It'd be nice if you knew the owners of those rings. What a story you could tell of all these owners of those rings. And, but that's, he, he buy 
likes them because he dislikes them. He just thinks they're wonderful pieces of art. Yeah, he has one of my books too. Yeah. Um, hey Steve, uh, this is Chris over on the side here. I have a question too. Uh, Steph just asked a question on that side. I just want to throw one out there too. Um, uh, we talked on the phone the one evening about um, you know so you have some of the SS rings and stuff like that, and uh, uh, I read the account that. Um, SS Sturmbannführer or uh, SS Major Heinz Macher had, uh, had worked under Himmler as a um, liaison and uh, had been tasked at the end of the war with, uh, Steve mentioned during the presentation, Wigglesburg uh, Castle, the SS, Himmler's SS Castle, where they had these kind of unusual ceremonies and uh, different things for the SS uh, leaders and stuff like that. And uh, they had housed the rings there from the fallen SS soldiers. And um, at the end of the war, Himmler tasked Mocker with uh, burning down and blowing up the uh, Babelsburg Castle, which he tried his best to do, but only partially. And then he was tasked also with taking 9,000 SS rings from the uh, castle and hide them, and to hide them. And they've never been found since. So I was telling Steve on the phone that, and Steve said too, I, I wonder if somebody would find that cache of uh, 9,000 SS death's head rings for the SS officers. They'd probably be worth a huge fortune, like a kind of a hoard from the, a hoard from the Middle Ages if found, and I just wonder, Steve, if you wanted to um, add a few remarks on that to the audience about, the, about your SS ring collection and, and what I talked about. And also, um, have you, have you ever, did you ever meet any SS or Waffen SS veterans on your search for rings or your travels, or did they tell you any stories about those rings or anything? I, I, I've seen a few of those rings. I, uh, the one I showed you is a, um, I wasn't gonna buy one of those rings to put it on the slide. Uh, so that's a reproduction, but it's a very similar to that. And some of them are very difficult. Uh, most military history-related magazines sell those rings. And a lot of uh, bikers buy them and other Nazi supporters buy those things for some reason or another. And it's, uh, it, you'd have to take it uh, with the condition to get it appraised by someone and that it's an authentic piece. If you can get it with the documents, it tells you exactly who it was issued to and certification, you probably have to pay for that to get it validated. But it's, it's one of those, you know, you only can spend your dollar once. <laughs> so if you spend it on a ring like that and it's not the real thing, it's resell it again, damages your reputation and it just discredits you. So it's one of those things you have to be really careful Unless you can afford to lose that money, you know, it's not an area to go into. If, if I was starting over again, I would go with World War I items because they're not mass produced. That was, unless you're going to mass produce something, it's not economical mass produced unless you're going to sell thousands of them. And so the World War I patriotic pins is a whole separate area that somebody that is limited on funds would be an interest in collecting or or the, uh, uh, the whiskey flask. A lot of the whiskey flask has people put their names, engrave their names, or put the units on, or put an emblem on there. I think these things are fascinating, yeah, thanks for that. Well, thank you all. Uh, other, any trips. other questions that we have, or? Um, Steph, right. do you see any over there? I'm gonna get out there before you line up for my okay. books. <laughs> okay, so, uh, um, oh, I'll just hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Oh, thanks. Um, Just have a couple of closing, uh, I have a couple of closing remarks before we, uh, before we kind of close shop for the night. Um, um, I will say a few more words here and thanks Mr. Bill Jackson right in front here for our founder and first president for being here. Thank you, Bill. And talk about a loyal member. He's, he's here basically every month of the year and uh, we thank Bill for that as well. Thank you, Bill. Um, so, uh, um, we did thank Steve, and Steve will be out in the back uh, selling and signing books for, for you if you'd like to purchase his book. He has brought many copies, so uh, don't worry about they should not run out, hopefully. Um, one of the most important things I need to talk about real quick is that uh, our next speaker, is just so you're aware, um, we do apologize that uh, we had a last minute cancellation of, of our World War II veteran, but that happens when they're 100 years old or so, you never know. Some things might come up sometimes. Um, but we're th we thank Steve once again for stepping in uh, on short notice. Um, so August 3rd, World War II PT vet, uh, boat veteran, uh, Navy veteran uh, uh, from the famous uh, 
uh, patrol torpedo boats. Uh, um, Charles Burkeen will be here as our August 3rd speaker. Then we have the September uh, 7th, a uh, former Rosie of the Riveter, uh, um, Dorothy Trait. She goes by Dottie normally. And uh, some of you might have seen her at the World War II air show before, and she'll be here as well um, in September. Um, so I want to thank any and all veterans that are here. Uh, you're a big part of what we do and, and what we celebrate every time that we meet. Uh, thanks to veterans from all, from all wars that are here. Uh, and um, I also need to thank always my, my fellow board members and, uh, and uh, other volunteers, like the helmet guys in the back and other volunteers that make everything happen for us month by month. Um, did we ever have, uh, was Frank Buck here tonight? Frank Buck from the World War II American Experience Museum? Is Frank's not here? Okay, okay. Somebody, uh, Jack said he might be here, uh, uh, Jack Myers, but I, I guess he's not here tonight. Uh, okay, and I need to also remind you about our helmet committee, the gentleman in the back. If, if you feel the desire to donate for our cause, uh, please do. We're always thankful for your gifts and, and your, and your, and your uh, donations. Um, so, I'd, and lastly, I need to thank all of you for being here. Uh, you make it happen as well, and thank you so much, and, and we'll see you next time. Thank you. Oh, I'm sorry, real quick, real quick. My friend Steph just uh, said I should also say that we're going to be stopping our postcards, so those of you that still get our postcards are, at the end of August, because we found that our costs were so high for postage costs and every month and, uh, and, the, and the renewal of the, uh, uh, the um, postal uh, uh, right for doing the bulk, bulk mail uh, rate as well. So thanks, guys, and, uh, and, and we'll see you next time. Thank you. Thank you.